Hello, uh, my name is Sami Saeed. I'm one of the SMOB candidate finalists. My name is Yosef Sarihun. I'm a junior at Springbrook High School, and I am a finalist for the 46th MCPS student member of the board. I'm a junior at Richard Montgomery High School, as well as SGA president at Richard Montgomery High School, and I'm really excited to be here. And how would you summarize your campaign in one sentence? I think, honestly, one phrase, change now, talk later. Make those necessary changes, and then do all the talking later. I'll give you my slogan, fighting for all. My focuses are 10 focuses. The essential focuses are focuses that are necessary for every single student. They're gonna encompass almost every single group. Mental health is a big one. Not just more mental health professionals, but better utilization. One thing that I really wanna ensure is that students are aware, you know, where their wellness centers at schools are. Just communicate, you know, we have wellness centers at schools. We have, you know, new school psychologists that are here for us. I visited nearly 30 schools. I've talked to hundreds of students and I've asked them all to name their school psychologists and I've got maybe one or two answers and for the longest time I didn't get a single answer. And I think that highlights a problem that is very deep rooted which is that students don't have access to mental health resources or at least not access to information about these resources. I want to make them more available not just you know in school hours but over the weekends or during breaks over Zoom in whatever way that we can. Though you know, our school, school bells, you know, last from whatever, you know, the eight hours in the day. Mental health never takes a break. I wanna make sure that we have uh, the right people associated and the right people to help students um, at all times. One of the first things is actually school lunches. I'm always advocating for better school lunches and more diverse school lunches. And the way to do that is student taste tested meals. So what I actually went ahead and did now is I got a student taste testing event at my school where we're gonna have new undeveloped lunches or like developing lunches that MCPS is doing that haven't been released to students yet and we're gonna have students taste test them as well as a discussion about school lunches in general. As soon as I get to the Board of Education, I know um, HANA created a committee, a work group around school lunches. I would expand it to create a student taste testing committee in which we'd have about five to 10 uh, students from every single middle and high school to come together monthly and taste test student meals, as well as bringing taste tested meals uh, or events where students can taste test meals to every single school. And I think that school lunches sometimes seems like a niche issue, but when you think about it, for a lot of students, it's the only, you know, the, one of the biggest meals they eat per day. So if we're giving them something that isn't gonna help sustain them energy-wise, nutrition-wise, they're not gonna have the energy to learn. And that's really harming academics, and that's har harming you know, the opportunities of students to really focus in cl the classrooms. If we can ensure that all the meals that go out are taste-tested and approved by students, as well as offering more diverse options, so not the classic white American options that we're offering right now, reaching out to a, a more diverse group, getting vegan options, kosher options, halal options, that's how we're gonna be able to ensure that our school lunches are the best they can be, and that's probably one of the first policies I'd pursue. The first thing that I really want to do as SMOB is initiate a task force to address the ongoing opioid epidemic. With this task force, I want new creative solutions in our county. I really want to expand on what the county has done already. Narcan distribution, better drug curriculum, and communication are my three-step plan to address the drug use issue in MCPS. Narcan, Narcan, Narcan. We need to get it in all of our classrooms. We need distribution for students. The county is taking great steps with uh, making Narcan more accessible to students, but I think that should be even taken to a further level and you know, communicating with students where it's at, so make it accessible like at all locations and all points of the school, bringing back drug counselors as well. I would try and work towards creating a contract with the company that runs Narcan and creating a deal where MCPS can buy up large stockpiles and distribute it out to students with the training kit. We should have days where students walk in and they say, hey, do you want to have you know, Narcan? And they can sign a form and then those students get Narcan because that's the difference between saving a student's life. All the time, what happens with Montgomery County is they wait and they wait until the problem gets out of control and then they put a bunch of resources to try and solve it when it's too late. This is one of those examples. We need to get Narcan to as many students as possible and train them on how to use it before the problem gets out of hand. Second one is curriculum. We hear from schools um, and they're telling us, you know, oh, don't do drugs, just say no, things like that. Those solutions aren't working and students, you know, are taking opioids, overdosing and dying. Our drug curriculum is outdated. It is a fact. We obviously should always be putting an emphasis on not doing drugs, but we should be putting more emphasis on how to save someone's life during an overdose, how to identify fake pills versus real pills, giving out fentanyl test strips to students. That's gonna be helpful because if you just constantly say abstinence, and students zone out and they start falling asleep and no one cares. But if you talk about those hard hitting topics, that's what's gonna get students engaged and that's what's truly gonna make a difference. That's what students are gonna remember. And the third and final thing is communication. When an incident does happen, there needs to be transparency. If we don't know the problem, we can never find a solution. I remember I went to a minority scholars meeting and they were talking about the issue and someone said, wait, what happened? I have no idea what you guys are even talking about. And that shocked me. 
that there's an overdose and a death in our county, multiple, and that people don't even know what's going on. The county has to stop trying to cover these things up and say, this is a problem and we need all hands on deck to find a solution. I'm half Yemeni um, and you know, I'm obviously brown skinned so you can kind of tell that. Um, throughout my middle school, I've been called a terrorist. I've been called things like a sand monkey before. Uh, that still happens sometimes. I know that students from a number of ethnicities and cultures have had similar experiences and it's absolutely heartbreaking that these things happen in our county. Many schools say there are no place for hate school and they just say that and then they stop there. No. If we're going to provide disciplinary action to students, what we need to do is discipline the students that are promoting hatred in our county, not the ones that are, you know, using drugs. They need rehabilitation support. I always say preventing instead of policing, prevention instead of suspension. We have to take a restorative approach. When there's a problem, we can't resort to putting a police officer in the school and saying the problems are solved. Not only is that not preventing anything, but that's the complete wrong approach as police officers make many students uncomfortable. I don't think that they should be in an educational facility. The students that are writing what they wrote on Whitman, the students that are drawing swastikas on desks and on lockers, those are the students that actually need disciplinary policy. We need to be having assemblies talking about hate in our county, addressing the problem. We can't just keep talking about things. We need to truly address the root of it. If they're going to create an environment of hatred, if they're going to create an environment that is going to make other students uncomfortable and scared to go to school, I believe that that student should be expelled. One thing that I think is unique about me and my perspective is that I am an NEC student, Springbrook being in the NEC. I know what it's like, you know, to have my voice silenced and really not feel heard. You know, I, I feel like I'm watching from the sidelines. You see, you know, the W schools, the MCR to small pipeline, things like that. You know, these things, they have an element of truth to them. Students that aren't part of these small groups, you know, really feel that they don't have the ability to make change. I know that as a Richard Montgomery student, our schools overrepresent. The way that I kind of go about solving that is looking at the student leadership organizations and seeing how can we maybe introduce limits on the number of students per school. Right now we have two people from Einstein on the executive board. And when you look at schools like Richard Montgomery, when you look at schools like in the upcounty kind of Clarksburg, they have like 20 to 30 and that's not fair. Now, I'm a Richard Montgomery student, but I don't want to keep having the overrepresented schools be overrepresented. It's all about the focus on getting those voices that aren't represented. Now I'm working on a survey that I want to roll out in my school and in help roll it out in DCC and NEC schools that is going to ask students about their knowledge of things like MCR, their knowledge of opportunities, and that's going to demonstrate those disparities. Once we show that, that's how you're going to be able to push the policy that's going to say, hey, we need these limitations, and that's going to be able to help the students. There's a number of you know, direct policies you can pursue, but changing the organizations that create those policies are a key thing. If you make the organizations, especially student-led ones, that are creating the policies for things like mental health, school safety, all that, if you make that equitable, then the rest of the policies are just going to become more equitable naturally. Ensuring every single student, all 87,000 middle and high school students, have equitable representation and have an equal chance of being able to get into these programs, you're going to see a lot of those problems begin to solve themselves as you know, the, the policies are not going to be up county, west county focused, but they're actually going to have more down county focus as well. You know, as I get up, I want to ensure that everybody gets a voice because I've had that feeling of not being heard and I don't want any, uh, any other MCPS student to ever feel that. Uh, I have things like the opportunity gap, of course, and that's a very complex issue. It's one that has been affecting our county for a long time and I have a number of things I want to do. Equitable funding for arts, athletics, and extracurriculars. So you have a lot of schools that are getting outside funding from boosters, right, from parent boosters, especially in athletics. And we're giving them the same funding that we're giving to schools without that extra funding, and that is not fair. You go to Bethesda, you go to Potomac, these are beautiful areas, these are thriving areas, and there's schools there are also beautiful and thriving. Um, and then you come here, schools are crumbling, and that, that, that's one thing I'm passionate about also, the funding in MCPS schools. Funds should go to schools that need them, not property tax. We need to allocate the funds from the schools that are already getting tens, hundreds of thousands of dollars from outside sources to the schools that don't have that. That way we can ensure that arts programs are equally funded. Athletics and extracurricular programs are equally funded. Another thing is offering more diverse coursework in DCC and NEC schools specifically. That's going to allow for students to really have more opportunities to explore career paths. Right now, if you have a number of diverse courses in Upper County and West County schools, those students have way more time and ability to explore those career paths than students in the DCC and NEC, and that's really not fair. And finally, diversifying our staff and our curriculum, which is another one of my focuses. Uh, we need to have staff and teachers that represent us, that look like us. You know, I'm Arab and I've never been taught by a Middle Eastern teacher, nor have I ever learned about the Arabian Peninsula. 
and how can we expect students to be engaged in learning when you know they're learning about a usually Euro European centered focus that's not connecting with them. I feel like what the school is teaching us and who I am are just two different things and I want to close that rift for all students. With all these issues, Arab students are always left behind. They're always kind of pushed in the corner and they talk about representation, which is great, but we're a forgotten group and I want to make sure that we're not left behind, that we're not forgotten, that the thousands of Arab students in this county do get representation as well as all of the other groups. Being Arab American specifically, some policies I want to pursue is one, getting Arabic as a world language in, in schools with high Arab populations. I've talked to so many students about this and people have begged me and they said, this is what we need. I used to go to Arabic school when I was little, but you know, as I grew up, we couldn't pay for it, we didn't have as much time. And if I was able to take that class in my school, I'd be able to connect with my family who don't live in the US and don't speak English. But I didn't have that opportunity, and a lot of students don't have that opportunity. And same with things like Amark. There's a huge Ethiopian population in our schools, but we're not addressing that because we're having the same old languages. Those are a few of my focuses. I got infrastructure renovations, I got transportation equity on there too, curriculum reform, but I think those are some of my key focuses I'd really put in my campaign. And what would be one thing you want every local student or voter to know about you? I think it's that I'm genuine and that I'm passionate. I will create change. I'm not going to sit here and talk, talk, talk. And if, let's say, I try and make change with the Board of Education and I get setbacks, I'm going to try and go to the officials directly and I'm going to try and make that change directly. I'm not just going to sit there and talk. I'm going to do every single thing I can to make that change whether I need to work through the Board of Education, whether I need to work around the Board of Education, whether I need to work with students directly, that's the way I'm going to make change. Hi Blair, I'm you know, really, really grateful for you guys having me. I really, really appreciate this opportunity. Um, you guys being part of the DCC, me part, being part of the NDC, I would really appreciate your guys' support because you guys are the reason I'm running. Ultimately, I was running because you know, the people down here, I really, really care about us, our voice, our perspectives. And, and if there's one thing you want to hear, I want you guys to hear from me is that I'm fighting for all and I'm fighting for you and I'm going to bring your voice to the MCPS Board of Education. So I appreciate your guys' support. Thank you. Yeah. About you as a person? Yeah. I think student government has absorbed a lot of my life. Like, I love researching new topics and I love, you know, debating. But I think I, there's a lot of things I like to do as well. Watching movies is definitely a big one. A fun fact about me is I've actually watched nearly a thousand movies and I love really developing you know a deep dive into the characters and really learning about them and it really and like the the plots like just so interesting to me to learn about new kinds of people and new environments and i think that's kind of something that kind of carries this mob which is i love to learn about different cultures and things of that nature and that's why i kind of want to bring that voice a lot more <laughs> apocalypse now oh my gosh um Marlon Brando, Martin Sheen, 1979. Takes place in the Vietnam War, but isn't about the war, it's about the characters. So over quarantine, I got really, really into cooking and baking. When it comes to ethnic food, I'm Ethiopian, um, and I can make injera, which is the flatbread that we use as a base for all of our food. So I can make that really, really well, and I pride myself in that. With all my cooking stuff and all my baking stuff, I personally, I really enjoy what I make, and I think I'm a good cook, a good baker. I'm also an Ethiopian Orthodox Christian, and we have fasting periods where we go vegan. A lot of my bake, you know, my baking items are vegan as well, so I really pride myself in that. I love making cookies. I love cookies so deeply. I really got into making cinnamon rolls, especially vegan cinnamon rolls, which do not taste different, which I'm so proud of. I've made some crepes. I've made some snickerdoodle cookies, all sorts of things. And then when it comes to cooking, I pride myself in my steak, and I never grill steak. You always cook it over a pan, and then I, you know, I treat it like an art. I make sure, you know, it's seasoned properly, and it has butter, uh, thyme, rosemary, garlic. I know this may be controversial, but I'm a cat person. They're, they're like so cute and I just love playing with my pets all the time too. I have a dog named Neo and a cat named Milo. We actually rescued Milo. My sister, she found Milo under like a generator and we decided to take him in. And you know, he's a great pet and I love to play with him all the time. But when I'm not playing with my pets, I'm not watching movies or I'm not debating, I'm usually focusing on school or the campaign or doing some sort of work because I really like to stay busy. I like to schedule things back to back to back. So I'm constantly moving and feeling productive. We're gonna do a quick lightning round about Montgomery County. Yeah. Um, so what would you say is your favorite restaurant? My friends are gonna make fun of me for this, Potbelly. Every single day I don't have a school visit, I go, let's go to Potbelly. I get the chicken club every topping except for tomatoes and onions every single time. Like it's so bad that like I come in and they're like, oh, original chicken club, everything. But, and I'm like, oh man, that's embarrassing. They know my order now. But yeah, that's definitely my go-to. I went to um, Cafe Rio for the first time. I love it. You're a musical artist? I'm a little weird because I listen to rock music. If I had to pick one, probably The Doors and Jim Morrison. They have a, such a wide variety of types of music. And also every time I put it on, it just hits every single time. So probably The Doors. Favorite song by me? Light My Fire. This is the solo. 
Favorite sports team? Oh, I'm a DC sports fan all the way. Nationals, Wizards, Capitals, um, Commanders. Barcelona, full, you know, diehard Barcelona fan.